Gather up your rail guns and crank up your angsty teenage energy, because today we're covering something brand new. Sweet, uh, <laughs> I'm open to new things, I guess. I'm talking about Murder Drones, one of the most popular animated series across all of YouTube. A series that has found a completely different, original way of communicating its story to us. Instead of using found footage or hidden shorts videos to tell its story like most indie projects, Murder Drones is releasing, get this, 20 minute episodes, one at a time, in sequential order. What? No QR? Our codes? No unlisted videos? Madness! Who knew that structuring your animated series like an actual animated series would feel so refreshing these days? Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that locked itself behind three layers of doors to hide from the watchful eye of the algorithm drones. And ladies and gentlemen, today we're gonna absolute solve the world that is Murder Drones. Produced by Glitch Entertainment here on YouTube, Murder Drones tells the story of some teenage robots who have to save the universe from a rogue AI program. And for as much as I was just praising the series earlier for its straightforward content delivery strategy, it doesn't mean that the story is a purely linear experience. This show is filled with twists, flashbacks, and fourth wall breaks that keep you on the edge of your seat, guessing about what's gonna happen next. And that's not an exaggeration either. If you look away for two seconds, you stand to miss a hidden detail or clue buried in something as simple as flashing source code, or a class presentation, which is where I come in today. Since this is a new series that I'd like to talk about moving forward, we are never talking about this. Talking about what? <laughs> like I said, since this is a new show that I'd like to talk about again sometime in the future, I want to start by giving you all a simple, straightforward overview of the plot and key details that'll help you fill in the gaps that you might have missed during your first or even your 40th watch through. I'm also going to be doing it not in episode order, but rather timeline order. The order that all the major events actually happened in the universe, since that's the way that makes the most sense, as opposed to the twisty way it's ultimately presented in the show. And hey, if I make a mistake along the way, just remember... I messed up in the same way I'm about to fix it! Then, by the end of the episode today, we'll actually solve the rest of the first season. That's right, we are six episodes in right now. Six episodes spread across two years, so why wait any longer? I suspect that I know the big twist reveals that are going to be planned for the final two episodes of the season, and potentially even deeper into the series. And if you don't want to be spoiled, well, I suppose you could always just forget everything that I say. Consider it, uh, repressed. So, let's rewind, or rather fast forward to the 3000s, as I introduce you to a potentially new series and solve where the Murder Drones universe is headed next. Get hyped, guys! And yet, I still feel nothing. The main story of Murder Drones takes place in the far future, the year 3071 to be exact, based on these balloons that we see in the background of Episode 3's prom scene. However, the real start to our story happened quite a number of years earlier. This was a time when humans were expanding beyond the confines of Earth to set up colonies on planets outside of our solar system, mining them for all their resources. One of the biggest players in this world was... J.C. Jensen in space. To help with both mining and domestic life, the company created a series of autonomous AI robots called Worker Drones, each with their own personality, thoughts, and feelings. Basically, these robots were indistinguishable from a normal living creature. Sadly, though, not everyone agreed, killing them for even perceived minor offenses. Western Villa style? Were you programmed by beasts? Pause it right there. Putting aside the obvious issues around techno ethics here, that type of behavior right there is a big no-no in the world of murder drones. You see, all worker drones came packaged with an established proper set of step-by-step -step instructions for decommissioning old robots. And they're delivered to us on old VHS tapes. Truly a film theorist classic. Why should you bother following those instructions? Well, disassembled drones may occasionally reboot from software death alone. More than undead federal fine hazards, it's corrupted AI carrying it. In short, if improperly disposed of, the dead robots might wake up, literally turning into zombie drones. And not only do they wake up, they're changed in that process. According to the VHS, these drones experience, quote, potentially hazardous mutations to their coding, which we later learn to be known as the Absolute Solver Program. And that, my friends, is why you always gotta take time to read the terms of service. We're told that there's only a 0.01% chance that the robots will come back to life, and of that 0.01%, only 0.7% have this dangerous mutation, thereby yielding a 0.007% chance that the improperly disposed of drone will have this absolute solver mutation. But of course, this incredibly rare, will probably never happen thing, in fact, does happen. And it happens in the form of a worker drone named Sin, waking up alone, confused, and scared in a pile of robot corpses. She's eventually found by a human girl named Tessa Elliott, who's taken a liking to some of the broken worker drones and has been repurposing them to be her friends. Among the drones Tessa's taken in are the lovable goof N, the butt-kicking V, and the incredibly loyal J. The whole letter is a lot to remember! 
But clearly, Sin is different. The Absolute Solver program that activated inside of her changed her. She speaks in a more robotic, Microsoft Sam-esque voice, literally stating her emotions as they happen. And it generally seems that she's on the fritz, acting like a puppet on strings. Sheepish. Nod. Giggle. I am so naughty. However, Tessa has a very different view on the drones than her parents. Parents who, it would seem, work as higher-ups at the J.C. Jensen Corporation. Well, that's never directly stated in the show, we can infer it from what's said during this moment when Tessa gets locked up by her folks. Sorry, boss. Corporate's spoken. Additionally, the family possesses an entire staff of worker drones at their mansion on Earth, treating them more like slaves and pests. Tessa James Elliot. We will not entertain your dumpster pits. Y yeah, yes, mother. Sin, infected by the hazardous mutation that is the Absolute Solver program, sees this and does not like it, eventually deciding that it would be much better if these humans just weren't around anymore. And so when the Elliots throw a big dinner party at their mansion, Sin executes her plan, transforming into some eldritch abomination and killing everyone at the party except for Tessa, the only human who decided to treat this robot with respect. And Sin didn't just stop at the party, she killed everyone on the planet by collapsing the core of Earth. We know it mutates and damaged AI. It took a sin as a host, then it took everything. And if you thought killing off a planet's worth of creatures would be enough, think again. Remember, at this point in history, humans have expanded far beyond just one planet, meaning Sin needed to find ways of infiltrating these exoplanets if she truly wanted to wipe humanity from existence. Thankfully for her, humans, ever the curious bunch, did most of the heavy lifting for her. After seeing what happened to Earth, the humans brought Sin's programming into their various systems to study it. And that was a big mistake. The Absolute Solver program does the exact same thing again on Copper 9, one of these human-colonized exoplanets and our main setting for the series. And again, all human life gets extinguished. The newly liberated worker drones now have no more commands that they need to follow. They are free to live their lives as they wish. And yet, this worker bot piece doesn't last for very long. At some point in history, a new breed of drones, the disassembly drones, or murder drones, arrive on the scene with a directive to eliminate all the workers. This forces the everyday bots to live behind a series of three protective walls attack on Titan style. And though the worker and murder drones drones are told that this comes straight from the J.C. Jensen Corporation, we learn in Episode 6 that that actually isn't the case. Instead, the murder drone massacres that are happening across various planets are being orchestrated by Sin for unknown reasons. Sin disappeared on Earth. Boss ran away. We mutually disengaged. Her last known act was sicking you lot on the human exoplanets. Why? That's what we're trying to figure out. Bozo. But that's weird, right? Sin initially retaliated against humans because of their callous mistreatment of the worker drones, but now she's sending murder bots out to massacre the very bots that she initially worked to free? Why? Well, I suspect it's for recruitment. I suspect it's a numbers game. If the odds of the absolute solver mutation activating in a dead drone is 7 in 100,000, you're gonna need to pile up a whole lot of dead drones in order to get a couple absolute solvers out of the group. Sin wants to kill more and more worker drones, not because she's cruel, but because she wants to build her army. What's more, the absolute solver mutation seems to get handed down between generations of robot families, which yes, is a real thing in this universe. So Sin may just be looking to speed up natural selection of this super trait by weeding out all the worker drones who don't possess it. This would basically be the concept of robotic eugenics. Get ready to clip this next section out for your MatPat out of context compilations, my friends, but you can't talk about murder drones without talking about World War II. During World War II, the Nazis firmly believed in eugenics eliminating quote-unquote undesirable genetic elements from the German population so that the ideal Aryan human could dominate. In order to create a race of genetically pure, physically fit human beings, they used tactics like forced sterilization and selective breeding to ensure the quote-unquote positive genes were the more prevalent and circulated throughout the gene pool. By eliminating all the normal worker drones, it enables the absolute solver code to dominate and procreate, for lack of a better term. Beyond that, though, Sin's motives remain unclear. Is it to build up enough of an army to fight against the last strong strongholds of humanity? Is it because she's lonely and she wants more like her? Is it because Absolute Solver has actually been in control of her this entire time? Currently it's unclear and we're just gonna need more time to see what happens. Anyway, it's finally time that we cut to the actual events of the show. Yeah, it is here, finally, where we cut back to the story of our characters as depicted in episode one. Uzi, our main protagonist, is one of the drones unknowingly affected with the Absolute Solver, having inherited it from her mother, Nori. Sadly, Nori was killed by the murder drones soon after Uzi's birth, and now a teenager, 
where Uzi is full of rebellious teen spirit, annoyed that the workers have hidden away from the murder drones rather than fighting them head on. So armed with a homemade railgun, she ventures out of the safety of the doors and meets N, V, and J, Tessa's drone army that she rescued so many years ago. And now, the murder drone squad tasked with slaughtering the workers of Copper 9. Except, there's one problem with this. By the end of the episode, Uzi's absolute solver has activated. Just can't wait to murder all humans. Classic robot stuff. I hope they're sitting pretty there on Earth, because we're coming for them. <laughs> As we're getting this cliffhanger ending, blink and you'll miss an important line of code flashing on Uzi's eye visor. It says absolute solver string equals false before quickly switching over to true. Yep, our main protagonist now has herself a penchant for human genocide, which again, feels weird since Uzi didn't die here. How could the absolute solver program have activated inside of her if she needs to have been a zombie bot for it to have activated? Well, remember the code for these drones functions a lot like DNA, meaning that their programming can be handed down between generations. It seems that Nori, the mother of Uzi passed it down to her daughter in the same way that human parents pass down hair color or some other disease or trait. And when passed down this way, Absolute Solver doesn't require death to activate. So Uzi teams up with the disassembly drones to solve the mystery of what's actually going on. Looking for clues around Copper 9 eventually leads the gang to a place called Cabin Fever Labs, an old JC Jensen facility. This place is filled with a lot of interesting details. For one, the show makes it canon that despite killing all humans on Earth, the doggos are in fact alive, safe, and immortal. See, sometimes a plot plot hole can be a great thing. Also at this place, we get ourselves a tiny hint about a new character. As Uzi's exploring the Cabin Fever Labs, she picks up some paperwork that talks about decommissioning a particular worker drone named S010011X01. We don't get an official name for the drone, but based on the way that this series turns serial numbers and names, the fans have dubbed this character S. You could argue that this is just a random sheet of paper, but I don't think so. This clue about an S drone happens in the same episode where we learn about the insane things that Uzi's mom used to say before she went full absolute solver. <sighs> she was always all, build doors against the coming sky demons. The singularity awakens. Look at this cool S I can draw. Sky demons, singularity, cool S. More S things. I believe this S character will be making their appearance sometime in the seventh episode of the series as a good robot built by Tessa to make some big reveal about Uzi's mom's death. You see, in this series, every drone has two numbers that ultimately identify them. One is their SN, or serial number, a string of letters and numbers unique to each character. The second number is the PN, presumably the product number. This string indicates what model of drone they are. Drones that are the same kind have the same PNs. We see that this is true with N and J, and presumably V, who all have themselves the same PN, Sin MYKX. Notice that CYN, or Sin, hidden right there. All the murder drones are part of the same Sin model group, and have been controlled by Sin at some point throughout the series. However, this S has itself a completely new PN that we haven't seen before, TSA MMAC. Now, the TSA there can't be a coincidence when we have ourselves a human named Tessa running around who loves repairing robots and is trying to stop Sin's quest of absolute domination. In addition, I believe we'll discover that S was a friend or colleague of Uzi's mother Nori. How can I be sure? Well, in episode 3, we're shown Nori's security badge, which shows that she used to work at Cabin Fever Labs. The same is true for Eva, another carrier of the absolute solver corruption. And wouldn't you know it, but Cabin Fever Labs is the same place that Uzi found the document about S. Furthermore, take a closer look at that document. We see black, creepy drawings written all over it. These drawings bear a striking resemblance to the ones that were drawn by Uzi's mother. So, I think at this point, it's far more likely that whoever this S character is will be an old ally of Nori and Eva and will be willing to lend a hand to Uzi and company as they try to defeat the absolute solver corruption. Moving back into the main story though for a minute, after exploring around Cabin Fever Labs, Uzi starts to act strange and we begin to see the full extent of her absolute solver powers. She transforms into some kind of monster and attacks all the other drones. After being talked down by N, Uzi returns to normal, solidifying them as the cutest couple ever. Eventually the team finds a key in the form of a robotic cricket that unlocks the innermost part of Cabin Fever Labs. They then run into Tessa Elliott, the girl who befriended Sin and the other drones back in the day. Tessa, now an adult, has made it her mission to stop Sin and any other Absolute Solver drones from taking over the universe. In the end of the most recent episode, we see Uzi, N, and Tessa finding their way to the elevator that leads down into the innermost lab, leaving them and us, the audience, curious about what they'll discover down there. And honestly, that's where the series stands at the end of episode 6. The creators of the show have said that the first season will consist of 8 episodes. We're really close to the end, and there's still a lot of mysteries that have yet to 
be solved. Is Uzi gonna fully transform into Sin? Is this mysterious S character gonna make an appearance? Will Tessa be forced to kill Uzi to save the world? Well, loyal theorists, it turns out you don't have to wait for the next four to six months for the final episodes to come out. I suspect that I already know everything that's gonna happen there, beat for beat, in the final two episodes. In fact, I suspect that we've known where the show was headed since the very first scene of the very first episode. Right after the opening exposition of episode one, the show reveals everything to us. Right when we're first introduced to Uzi, she's given a PowerPoint presentation to her class about the dangers of sitting around waiting for the murder drones to find a way past the doors. Hide under the ice behind three stupid doors? It's like we're waiting for an inciting incident. As she's talking, this diagram appears behind her. This image is almost a complete rip of the infamous hero's journey. If you're not familiar with that, the hero's journey is a storytelling template that many of the stories throughout history have followed. From ancient epics like Gilgamesh and the Odyssey to modern classics like Harry Potter and Star Wars, if you're writing yourself a fantastical story, then the hero's journey is breaking down the format of your narrative. Now, on my first viewing, I saw this reference as just that, a reference. Murder Drones loves meta humor and fourth wall break, so I just chalked this up to another inside joke. However, when I went back to the series again in preparation for this theory, I realized that everything that's happened in the first six episodes has lined up exactly with this little visual gag. Beat for beat. We start off with the call to action that draws the hero into adventure. Uzi wants to leave the safety of the doors and deal with the murder drones directly. Then she gets saved by an unlikely aide, N. Right after this, Uzi teams up with Helper, Dal, and a mentor who's been around the block, Tessa. Together, this crew fights back against a bunch of challenges, and Uzi becomes more and more tempted to use the absolute solver abilities, culminating with her being fully possessed by Sin and N having to cut off her hand in episode 6. And mind you, this diagram isn't just for any generic hero's journey. It is one that is specific specifically built for Uzi. Notice all the references to angst moments built into this wheel. And if there is one emotion that definitely connects back to Uzi, it is angst. An angsty teen fad bite me, and I made you rebel like an angsty teen, which got you killed. So if I'm right, that then leaves us right here on the chart, at the bottom. Ready for another helper, and a big revelation that's tied to three specific things, rebirth, abyss, and death. So remind me again where these characters are exploring Cabin Fever Labs, a giant underground facility that keeps going down down to the center point, an abyss, if you will. And who have we been talking about this entire time? S, a potential new helper associated with Uzi's dead mom, who probably has more information than anyone about what happened to her. According to the hero's journey, at this point, Uzi, our hero, will be given some sort of a revelation. S is gonna reveal some saucy detail, something that, according to our template, will lead Uzi to a full angst overload. If what we've seen previously are just tiny overloads, what could this possibly look like? What could be so devastating for Uzi to hear that it'll send her into a presumed meltdown. Well, I suspect that S is gonna reveal that N was the murder drone who killed Uzi's mom. Yeah, I'm just as shocked as you are, but N is the most likely killer. At this point in the series, we don't actually know what happened to Nori. All we know was that she was bitten by some murder drone and that Nori's father ultimately had to put her down. On Copper 9, there's only three murder drones that we know of. V, J, and of course, N. Nothing would make for a more catastrophic revelation than finding out your new boyfriend is the one that killed your mom. This devastating news will be too much for Uzi to handle, and she'll fully succumb to her absolute solver powers, going full angst overload. Then, after being saved once again by N and the crew, Uzi will atone for her sins and make her mission for season two clear. Defeat Sin, stop the absolute solver, and end the cycle of violence that prevents humans and drones from living the peaceful lives they want. So, there you have it, my friends. Murder drones! The plot so far, as well as a solid hypothesis or two on where it might be headed in the final episodes of the season. How am I so sure about this? I guess you could say it's a mixture of Easter eggs, narrative logic, and a whole lot of watching other forms of media. You know, stuff like movies, TV shows, and of course, anime. Oh, and they said pirating all that anime was useless. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.